We'll look at the 23rd verse, and then we'll move on from there. So let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. You'd all agree with that, wouldn't you? He's the faithful one. When he gives his word, it's immutably unchangeable. So uh, let us follow him in that pattern of faithfulness. Let's be faithful without wavering. No reason. Uh, of course, the devil is all about doubt, and he sows doubt all the time in our hearts because he's the god of this world. So there's a lot of depressing things surrounding us, um, and as a result, it kind of brings the spirit down. And uh, you and I have to uh, live above that. So greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So we're to hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Now, agreed, that there are passages in the scripture that seem to lay all the responsibility of our salvation on ourselves, keeping yourself in your most holy faith, Jude says. This passage seems to though be as though we must hold on to our faith. You know, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. So, you know, this is uh, the obligation seems to be, and the onus seems to be upon the believer to keep himself saved. But in fact, we realize that it's the keeping power of the Holy Spirit. He's the anchor of the soul. We've seen that on so many other occasions. So this is, uh, so to speak, the other side of the two-edged sword. So there are places that speak uh, of uh, the security that we have in Christ. Uh, we can go to so many places on this. We're in the Father's hand, and no man shall be able to pluck us out of the Father's hand. But in this case, it seems as though we're supposed to be holding on to God. I've always illustrated it with a little infant. A little infant, um, well, you hold on to that baby like, well, of course, nothing more important than that, uh, the way we hold on to our little babies. I can remember my dad taking uh, my younger, younger, younger sister, and uh, he would pick her up and say, sack of potatoes, and then pick her up, you know, on the shoulder and so forth, and uh, she'd just squeal with joy. You know, there's nothing like the embrace of a daddy, right? And it's a shame they grow up. That's my view. I mean, we should keep them right where they are, right? Five is fine with me. But at any rate, so uh, now who was holding whom? We, was, we would think, well, of course, the father's holding the child. Yeah, but the, you'll see the child uh, gripping and holding on as well. And, and to some degree, you think, well, you know, they're holding on to the father, but uh, we're not going to depend on that. How long is that going to last, that a child can... By, by their grip hold on to their father. Instead, it better be that the parent is taking control. But there's a truism on both sides, so that's the two-edged sword. And in this case as well, uh, you hold on to the Lord like it counted on you to hold on to your salvation. Uh, all the while understanding that uh, it's, uh, he is faithful that keeps us. Uh, so that's the notion here. Now, of course, remember that the dynamic here in the book of Hebrews is that we've got people that are uh, less than uh, assured of salvation because they they were wavering and Paul was trying to call them out on this and he wants them to uh, to vow allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ so the, here we have them as we've mentioned so many times in this particular lesson and well before this in the sixth chapter and some other places so we have the Jew here hearing the gospel and it sounds so good in Christ Messiah uh, let's not forget that um, it wasn't, uh, uh, well, maybe 25, 30 years before this that the town uh, of Jerusalem uh, had been struck by an earthquake at the very moment that Jesus dies on the cross. The veil in the temple was rent in two. Um, it was told thir three days after that, that uh, many came back out of the graves and, and went to visit people uh, under the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then Jesus himself appears to his disciples and over 500 brethren at one time. So incontrovertible evidence of his resurrection. Uh, of course, 30 years after the event, there are people now that are wondering whether it really happened or not. Uh, the details are somewhat fuzzy. Some of them were maybe just children at the time, and now they have to make their own decisions. And it's difficult for them because, in a sense, this would mean to be ostracized from the Jewish community. Uh, in fact, uh, the Orthodox Jews to this day will have a funeral for any child that uh, decides to follow Jesus Christ. So it was no different in the first century. You know, some posit that Paul, the apostle, 
must have been married because one of the qualifications for being a member of the Sanhedrin would be that you were married. Uh, and he was, we know, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, thus he, he at least had to have been married at some point. So what happened to his wife? Well, you could say she died. That might have been the case. He never mentions the circumstance. Uh, but he seems to understand something about the dynamic of husband and wife, and he mentions it in 1 Corinthians 7. So, he, uh, so what happened? And some people posit that his wife uh, had a funeral for him and divorced him uh, because he had become a Christian. So uh, take what you want from all of that. The point is that it was very difficult in the first century for a Jewish person to be converted to Jesus Christ. There was a lot of persecution that went along with it. So they were uh, betwixt these two uh, truths. Shall I follow the, the uh, temple in Jerusalem and the sacrifice that's been established now for a millennia of uh, time, or shall I follow Jesus? What shall it be? And so Paul is encouraging them to hold fast without wavering and nothing to turn back to, that notion. So we had seen this uh, many times before. Uh, third chapter, if we hold fast the confidence with the rejoicing of the hope and firm unto the end. Uh, so, and also we have, again, we are uh, made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. This is what gives a lot of people the justification of the Arminian perspective that you can lose your salvation. They'll look at places like this in Hebrews in particular. These become proof texts to them that you can lose your salvation, that you have to hold on to it. Um, and there to this day, there are many people that hold that perspective and um, they even mock this idea of uh, easy believism where we're kind of giving salvation away and then telling people, well, you can't lose it. So that gives them license to go out and do whatever they want to. And all that proves is they never had it to begin with probably. But you can understand why verses like this can become confusing. But I think you understand the particular dynamic of the first century and what was happening at that a juncture in human history, uh, these uh, exhortations make a lot of sense. Paul, again, is not omniscient. And so when he's writing to them, he's encouraging them and exhorting them. He doesn't know whether they're saved or lost. And so as I've said before, if we're a true believer, and we see a passage like this where the Bible says, now hold fast without wavering, what, uh, what would the believer think? The believer would think, well, of course I'm going to hold fast. Or like Peter said, to whom shall I go? Those are the words of eternal life. There's nothing to turn back to. Uh, we would know we'd sooner turn back uh, to the world than uh, uh, Lot's wife that turned back to Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, we, there, there's our illustration, right? Why, we, we would we'd no, no want uh, to be anywhere compared to that kind of uh, rebellion. So... Clearly, we hold steadfastly and firmly, confidently, all the way to the end. And that's, that's what believers are about. Again, Paul is trying to move these people that are in the middle and that are fence straddlers. And there's no place for fence straddling. Jesus doesn't allow it, as a matter of fact. Either you're for me or you're against me. We think of the uh, dramatic scene on Mount Carmel. You know, you go uh, up there and we've got the... The scene is set, there's apostasy in Israel, and Ahab and Jezebel, that harlot wife, uh, have uh, now uh, set up as the national religion idolatry, and people worshiping images and bowing down to statues that have no power. Elijah's had enough of it, and it was time for a contest. A day of decision had to be had, and so uh, he mount up to Mount Carmel. He says, let's prove who the true God is today, and you, you know the story so well. You can read about it in 1 Kings it's chapter 18. But Elijah came unto all the people and said, how long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him, and if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, and this is incredible to me, they answered him not a word. <laughs> so they're mute. Uh, this has to break the great heart of God. When people have opportunity to, to aver their faith and to stand up and say, yes, this I believe, no, you'll never take this away from me. And these people are mute after all that God had done for them. So it's an incredible insult and despite unto the holy name. So there was no fence straddling that day. You're either for him or you're against me, but they didn't say anything. Uh, they wanted to see how this would all work out first. 
And of course, our God came through in a miraculous way with fire from heaven. There's the passage. Jesus said, he that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me is scattereth abroad. So that's where, that's where it is. We can't be in the middle on the issue of salvation. So we want to be, uh, we want to be firm in our belief. And so Jesus made it very clear here. You're either for me or you're against me. I can remember back uh, 9-11, uh, so we remember that day. I mean, that is that burns in our psyche. Where were you when you learned the news about the Twin Towers falling? And I can remember George Bush, our president, uh, he stood up with the megaphone. He said, the people that brought these buildings down, they're going to hear from us. And everybody standing up and cheering, and it sounded like a great idea, right? The only problem was that he was good and close friends with the House of Saud. And there were 19 of the attackers were Saudi Arabians. So it would seem to me then that it was time for us to pledge allegiance to the United States of America and cut out Saudi uh, money and gas and oil and so forth. And it sounded like a, sound to me like if you're either for us or you're for the terrorists, which, which side are you on? Saudis, of course, were on both sides. They were fence straddlers financing the whole evil agenda at the same time with our money. I mean, it, it was really an incredible time there. And of course, what did we do? We went to Iraq. <laughs> okay, at any rate, uh, go ahead, try to understand all of this political theater. I can't wait for the great day of judgment when all the secrets are finally come out. We find out who was paid off and who was getting money from this person and that person. How all the evil machinations of a very lost world come together to bring about wars and rumors of wars. Uh, but uh, Jesus is coming. And when he comes, he'll straighten this matter out because he's nothing but truth, absolute truth. And we'll find that there'll be no uh, in-betweeners at that point. So I hope you're on the right side tonight, are you? All right, so hold fast that which is good, we're told in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. Cleave to that which is good. Hold fast that which is good. We fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Okay, so you hold on to it like you, it was it, like having what? A bag of gold in your hand. How would you, how would you clutch it, right? You'd hold it like that. You're not going to let anybody take that from you. This is far more important. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession for many witnesses. So uh, uh, throughout the uh, pastoral epistles, and again in Timothy, we have Paul encouraging him, hold fast, uh, holding faith and good conscience, and which some having put away concerning the faith, have made shipwreck, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Uh, so this is something that we have to check ourselves every day on because, you know, the devil does his work uh, in, a, in a rather deceptive manner and comes in little by little, eroding the faith and uh, does what he can. Anybody here ever have termites in your house? Uh oh, anybody have termites? Nobody's had termites. Oh, okay, good. They uh, do their uh, good. I mean, at least I have somebody that understands the illustration. And what happens to the termite? The termite comes in uh, uh, stealthily. You don't even know he's at work. You can't hear him. But meanwhile, he's chewing out the base plate, you know, where the foundation ends, the cement block ends, and there's a plate on top of that. And, and then the superstructure is built on the plate. And, the, and they go for the plate. So they come up out of the ground. They worm their way in somehow. They even get through brick or whatever is out there on the exterior, and they get through to the wood, and they just start eating away the first six inches of your building. And of course, now the whole building structure, if they get their opportunity, is uh, ruined, and the superstructure is in jeopardy at that point. Well, the devil works the same way. He works to erode the foundations, and that's why it's critical in all these epistles that we read. Uh, and especially when we come to the end there with Jude, he kind of gives that final punctuation, you know, that one chapter where the believers are encouraged to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And believers are to hold fast the foundational truths. 
And we're watching the evangelical community now, little by little, you know, they erode these things. And this is not, not that important that we teach eternal damnation, not important that we have a verbally inspired scripture. And they go on and on with this. And this uh, is a very dangerous proposition and is what ultimately leads to great apostasy. So uh, believers are challenged in this, and you and I now, as we're getting older, have to pass the baton to the next generation. That next generation has to be uh, thoroughly grounded, rooted, uh, and uh, will not be moved from the things that they have learned, knowing of whom they've learned them. That makes a big difference, too. So in Proverbs 3, so it says, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee, bind them about thy neck, write them upon the table of thine heart. So we've got, uh, we've got the notion here of holding it and keeping it and memorizing it, putting it here in the heart. Um, then again, you see here in the pastoral epistles how often Paul gets back to this point to hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus, holding fast the faithful word as uh, hath been taught that may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. And uh, that good thing which was committed unto you, keep by the Holy Ghost, which dwelleth in us. All right, so back to Hebrews, or in the 10th chapter, 26th verse. So he says, if we sin willfully, after that after we've received the knowledge of the truth, this again, you can see where Arminianists uh, will uh, take passages like this and say, you see, they were saved and they lost their salvation. You had to hold on to it. If you didn't hold on to it, then you lost it. And this seems as though when it says, if uh, we sin willfully after we have received, now what does it say? The knowledge of the truth. It didn't say that we received the truth. It said we received the knowledge of it. And there's a big difference. The difference is that, well, almost every week we have unsaved people that come in here and leave. They don't come back, but they come in and they heard the word. They received the knowledge of the truth. And they could have done something with it. And perhaps they did. But some people will consider it for a while, ruminate on it a bit and see. But then they begin to count the cost. As Jesus said, you have to, if you're going to be a committed disciple, you'll have to understand and count the cost before you just make some kind of verbal commitment. You have to mean it. And it may cost something in the sense of persecution. It may cost something in the way of friendship. It may cost something even in your job. When you become a Christian, there are certain things that you just cannot do any longer. And, uh, well, if we sin willfully after we receive, have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Now, this is a curious expression, no more sacrifice. It means, in other words, that if you reject what Christ has done on the cross and you turn your back on that, you've heard the knowledge of the truth, you heard the way, the truth, and the life, but you decide not to commit to that, or maybe for a season you listen to it and play with it, and that seems to be what they were doing here in this first century. But they don't really make a firm commitment. And of course, then the test comes. God permits the test, the test of faith. And for them, it was, what, which way are you going to go with this? You, you can't go to the temple and go to Christian meetings at the same time because you're learning opposite truths now. The temple's telling you the only way to heaven is through sacrificing a goat, sacrificing a lamb. Your only way is atonement. And that Christ is a false Messiah. That's what they were teaching in the first century. And, uh, of course, then they, they go and listen to one of the Christian meetings. Uh, and that would be on the first day of the week. And they, you'd listen to that and say, you know, that sounds right. And then you're kind of caught betwixt. At some point, you have to make your mind up. It has to be a decision. And so after you've heard the knowledge of the truth, you were exposed to it. And that's what Hebrews 6 means when it says you've tasted. You're sampling, that's all. You tasted it, uh, but you turn away from it. It's impossible to renew them to repentance. Or in this case, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. There's no other way to be saved. If, if you're not going to come to Christ, there's no sacrifice for sin that's going to get you to heaven. And, and that's the proposition the apostles putting before them. Instead, a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. The very strong uh, speaking here, and we're talking about eternal damnation. 
And again, this is a doctrine that is uh, laid by the side. The modernists uh, tone it down. They, they have this hard time reconciling a, a, a God that would be a loving and merciful God sending anybody to hell. And uh, so they don't speak much about it. They're not sure about it. Uh, uh, some of them have even moved into annihilation where they believe, well, okay, they, they're burned up, but that's the end of it. But the idea of eternal suffering, it's, it's a hard concept. And you and I, of course, have great mercy on other sinners, don't we? I mean, really, because we were sinners ourselves. And so we could, say, we could see, you know, the proposition. Yeah, you know, how, how could God do that? How could a loving God do it? And uh, the problem is, that's what it says is going to happen. Uh, now, we'll get to the 12th chapter where it says that our God is a consuming fire. And the annihilationists like to latch hold of that. Consuming, they say, consuming fire. So what does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things, as a matter of fact. It can mean total destruction or annihilation, but it means other things as well. Well, we'll study this in Hebrews chapter 12, so we'll not be confused when someone confronts us with a passage like that. It seems as though, well, if they're consumed, they're, they'll, they'll be no more. And yet, so many other places speak about the sensual uh, experience of those that are in hell, uh, like the rich man in Luke 16. All right, so... There's a certain fearful looking for of judgment. So when we recognize that God is going to pay the price. So, so here's this poor undecided, when, shall I trust the finished work of Christ? Or shall I, uh, shall I uh, go back and run back to the temple and believe that the lamb uh, and his blood at the uh, brazen altar will save my soul? What, which, which way am I going to go with this? They have to make their decision. And if they make the wrong decision, there'll remain no sacrifice for their sins. Uh, because that, uh, that atonement that certainly was valid up until the finished work of Christ. Once Christ finished the work, uh, it was now invalid. All the sacrifice of the temple, invalid, unnecessary. Christ finished the work. Thus, the temple, in the temple, there's a great earthquake and the veil is rent, demonstrating it, it's, it is no longer needed. All right, so... Uh, there he's making his uh, doesn't know which way to go poor fellow so now last week we brought up the point of commensurate judgment and our next verse really tells us about that he that despised Moses law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sore punishment I've underlined sore punishment so we understand there's degrees in punishment and that those degrees are meted out on God's commensurate judgment to whom much is given much shall be required uh, Peter will say, uh, I think I even have that up here, so we'll get to that. So, of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he but be thought worthy of, whom hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. And so this is a, a searching question. And it comes out, of course, uh, here almost at the end of this chapter, and intentionally placed there that we might have decision making. So, of how much sore punishment indeed? Let me see, there it is. Uh, so, Peter says a similar thing when he says, For after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein. Now, so they got the knowledge of the truth. And I don't know, there's a sense in which, uh, boy, you get the truth out, and there are people that will take elements of that truth, and they say, well, I'm okay. Hey, I believed. I'm, I'm good. Don't worry about me. I'm okay. And why, are, why am I worried about them? I'm worried about them because there's no fruit in their life. Nothing indicates that the Holy Ghost is inside of them. Now, we can give babes in Christ uh, some leeway here. They're, they're still growing. But people that have been that claimed to be saved for years now, oh, they got saved when they were kids and so forth. And, and uh, we, are they really saved? Now, again, we're not omniscient, so how would we know? But we know that the case is put forth here in many places in the Scripture, that there are those who were exposed to the knowledge of the truth but weren't committed to that truth. And certainly Peter indicates this here, and we see it in our text in Hebrews 10. So after, after they've escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. It had been better for them, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. 
So, I mean, this stands as a warning for us. Then Peter, uh, you know, in that 22nd verse gives the illustration of the, of the uh, sow that was washed returning to its uh, filth, you know, in the mire, wallowing in the mire, and the dog returning unto its own vomit. A very graphic illustration of a person that was never saved to begin with. But like we see here in Hebrews, went along with the, the knowledge, listened to it for a season, uh, maybe even professed it to some degree, and said, well, I believe that. But, uh, but their heart wasn't attached. And so what, ultimately, they're drawn back. So we've got this notion, of course, the Bible says uh, uh, that uh, if we draw back into perdition, that uh, God has uh, no favor. So the notion of being drawn back and pulled back into the temple now, I mean, I mean it would be the same in a sense. A person is a Roman Catholic, raised as a Catholic, here's the truth and understands now what a difference this is. I mean, it's like a whole new world and you begin to understand what the truth is. Your eyes are opened. I can't imagine them going back to the mass. Uh, why would they go back to the mass when they realize the work has been settled and, and, and so on? Why would they go back to confess to a man, in some cases a pervert, uh, in a closet and tell him your sins when there's only one to tell the, your sins? Once you've known that truth, why would anybody turn back to it? Well, the answer has to be that they never really embraced that truth. Uh, they thought on it for a while. They, in some way even, perhaps it catapulted them to certain victories in their life. Uh, so many places uh, that have the 12-step um, program. And uh, I was invited, in fact, about 25, 30 years ago, I guess now, to speak at... Uh, uh, the program on the north side. It was uh, it was the uh, originator in Pittsburgh of the program, and he had uh, met me in the jail, the founder of the program. And he said, "Oh, he said we'd love you to have you come and speak to the guys." I said, "Well, I, any opportunity." And I went and I preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, and uh, I, I I said, "All you need is this book, fellas. You need you need Jesus in your heart. You need to have the Lord." So he got up, you know, and he said, "Now, now, Reverend," he said, "We've got another book. We've got the big book." And he brought out this, they call it the big book, you know, and it's the 12 steps and all that sort of thing. So you see, there are people that are exposed to an element of the truth. Uh, and there's an element of truth in the 12 steps. You've got to hit your knees every day. You've got to acknowledge a power greater than yourself, that sort of thing. And uh, they claim that Wilson was a Christian and founded it on Christian principles and, and primarily the book of James. But when I read his writings, I'm not seeing that at all. But I mean, we'll find out. I hope that he was. But they certainly have changed it since then. And now it's, you, you know, your teddy bear can be your higher power. Uh, you can have a tree or a plant in the backyard and you go to pray to it or whatever it is. And so as long as you hit your knees every day. So it, it's a form of godliness, but it denies the power thereof. So that's the notion. And Peter brings this out, I think, in full light here when he speaks of it. It had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the Holy Commandment. Now, this doesn't frighten any true Christian that we would look at that and say, well, maybe I'm hearing too much. Well, we can't hear too much. You know, to us, we have a hunger for that word. So uh, back to this commensurate judgment concept. Uh, and I, met, I brought this out last week, but Luke chapter 10 Jesus said, but I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable <clears throat> in that day for Sodom than for that city. Whoa. Uh, and now he speaks about the great works that he had done in uh, Chorazin and Bethsaida and the uh, Decapolis and the cities surrounding the Sea of Galilee, where he did most of his wonderful works. And uh, he said, it'd be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for the cities that saw the work of the living Son of God and turned from it. And uh, so you can see it's a, it's a stern admonition here. But I say unto you, it would be more tolerable on that day for Sodom than for that city. Woe unto Chorazin, woe unto the Bethsaida. For if the mighty works that had been done in uh, Tyre and Sidon uh, would have been done in you, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it shall be more tolerable for so Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you, uh, which art exalted to heaven. Uh, uh, Capernaum, uh, thou which art exalted to heaven, shalt uh, be thrust down to hell. So now uh, Tyre and Sidon and the, these places, of course, uh, 
shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon. Now, these were wicked cities. These were cities given to idolatry. Uh, many of them contained the enemies of God in it and so forth. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, perverts and so on. Homosexuals, lesbians, fornicators, adulterers, you name it, they did it. And so, uh, and yet God uh, said they, they didn't have as much light. So, so in a sense, you see here the, the notion of a commensurate judgment. But the people of, uh, uh, that were contemporary with Christ and saw the mighty works of the Son of the living God, saw him touch blind eyes, uh, saw uh, cities and villages bringing all their sick people, and he healed every one of them, it says. Uh, it was incredible. And then to hear him speak, my, what more could one ask for? In fact, all that was given to them would be uh, there at the judgment day. And it, would, it will uh, weigh against everyone that had heard his words. But uh, he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required. To whom men have committed much of him they will ask the more. So there's the notion again of a, of a, uh, a, a kind of degrees of judgment. So what we what see a greater punishment here in Hebrews chapter 10. Much sore punishment because they had been given so much. They had heard so much. Anybody on the other side of the cross and resurrection now so far more culpable than they were before that, where they're, in a sense all they could see was some, somewhat obscurely the typical pictures of the coming of the Lamb of God. But once he came, uh, we are without excuse and, and no question about it. Now, I already mentioned there are degrees of punishment, uh, and that's what commensurate judgment is about, and that's what hell is, as a matter of fact. So you see there in Revelation tw uh, 20, 12, I see the dead small and great stand before God. The books are open, and another book is open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. According to their works, the sea gave up the dead which were in them, death and uh Hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to his work. So, so there's even tautology or uh, repetition happening right within the uh, parallel verses. So the notion is uh, how the lost will be judged according to their works, and thus degrees of punishment, as we just saw in Luke chapter 12, uh, described there as, as type, as uh, stripes, beaten with many stripes. He that did not. Um, commit sin, did not commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. So that's the notion of it here. Um, Luke, of course, uh, well, there's there's uh, Second Peter first. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation, to reserve the unjust to the day of judgment, uh, to be punished. So um, degrees of punishment uh, as well. And of course, in Luke 20, greater damnation. And uh, Hebrews 10, 30, which uh, is the text that we'll be looking at here. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense at the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. We'll have more to say about that. And then a uh, passage that I, I mentioned we'll be looking at shortly. For our God is a consuming fire. And we'll understand what that consuming is all about. Okay, back to where we started there. So of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. Now I've assembled a little slide here to perhaps help us understand a bit of what this imagery is. Because Paul is employing here imagery and it requires some degree of interpretation. So he's speaking again of the degrees of punishment. And he said, these uh, that have trodden underfoot the Son of God. So the priest goes into the temple, uh, having made the sacrifice at the brazen altar outside of the temple. Then he walks into the temple and he goes into the holy place. And then he stands before the veil and he sprinkles blood in the entrance of the veil. Then he enters in beyond the veil, takes blood again and sprinkles the mercy seat. Now, that was the Old Testament means of atonement for sin. And uh, 
now we're looking at what happens to a person. Now that we've got Christ, the finished work. He sheds his blood at uh, the cross, which is his altar. He gives up his life. He becomes a priest now, making intercession for us. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So he's saying sacerdotal prayers at this point for us. And so now what happens? But the person hears the message, understands what Christ has done, and turns his back on it. And runs out of this torn veil, uh, holy seat, mercy seat, and runs away and runs back to the temple worship. And as he does this, he tramples underfoot the blood that has been sprinkled for his sanctification. And thus, he does despite to the third person of the Godhead, who has led him all the way to hear this truth. Remember, Jesus said, I'll not leave you comfortless. I'll send another comforter. Uh, and that another comforter is the Holy Ghost. And the work of the Holy Ghost is to draw men unto salvation. And as he draws men in uh, the, the great uh, draft, so to speak, uh, draws the net, uh, men have opportunity to be saved. And, uh, but uh, the Holy Ghost does not violate one's sovereignty. A person makes their own mind up. But the Holy Spirit is sent to convince and convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Nobody here is saved without that work. At some point in your life, you got rightfully afraid of meeting a holy God. You recognized your jeopardy. Now, we have such sottish people today. I, I, they, <laughs> they don't even recognize the, the jeopardy that their souls are in. They don't. They are so blithe. Uh, and all around them, they recognize how temporary life is. They expose themselves constantly to the news where they're hearing about this one was shot, this one was uh, uh, fell off a, a cliff, this one, you know, uh, was out swimming uh, and snorkeling, and a shark came and uh, ate them. Uh, the earthquake, thousands of people dead. Tsunami, uh, half a million people dead in ten seconds. Uh, about uh, 12 years ago. So they, you hear all, they hear all this. They're exposed to all this. And yet, you know, they go along like, well, you know, nothing to worry about here. Everything's going to be okay. And they have such a, uh, a sanguine attitude. It's, 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 it's foolishness. Their confidence, what are they, their confidence in something that Satan has given them, a false assurance. Everything's okay. They're not worried about their soul. They're worried about the here and now, that's all. They're worried about who's going to win the Steeler game on Sunday. They're worried about things that really don't matter. But if you say, well, what about your soul? Well, you know, they're, they're not interested. There's no interest in that. The devil's really done his work, folks. <laughs> but you can see that's the work of the Holy Ghost. That's the spirit. And when we reject the Spirit's work, where he's tugging at our heart, he can only do so much of this now, because obviously we have our own right to believe, and we are not forced to believe the truth. And there's this, uh, I, is it a dynamic equivalence in some cases where, you know, Satan is able to pull on one side and the Holy Spirit on the other. You know how oftentimes you see the good angel and the bad angel, you know, on a person's shoulders. And there seems to be, and you're in the middle in this tug of war almost. So there might be some sort of uh, equilibrium that's involved in good and evil. Uh, but so much so that neither one, the devil nor the Holy Ghost, can force a person to follow them. That person stands sovereign in the middle of it, making his own or her own mind up. It'll be their decision. And I'm sure glad that people that make their minds up can still be changed. God still lends them breath for a while. And even while they're breathing out threatenings like Saul of Tarsus, God can still speak to their hearts. And I don't know where the point of no return is. We call that the unpardonable sin, don't we? And um, Jesus is warned of it, but didn't uh, declare that anybody had committed it. Romans chapter 1 indicates that God gave them up to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So uh, that indicates to me that there, there must be some line that a person crosses. And once they cross it, that there is no return. So, uh, of course, since I don't know where that is and you don't know where it is, then we continue to do what we can to try to persuade people. There was a fellow uh, had a hard, hard, hard heart. Um, but 
uh, an older lady here in the church wanted to marry him. And uh, she had brought him to church. And I can remember them sitting right here about third road back, I remember. And he was all smiles and so forth. And, um, you know, they were they were dating. And uh, I thought, well, you know, he's coming to church and so on. So she said, I, I, Pastor, I want you to marry us. I said, well, I have to talk to him. I can't uh, put people together unless I know you're you're both saved or in some cases both lost. Uh, as long as it's, I don't want any unequal yoke. OK, so uh, let's find out. I said, no, you're saved, but we're going to find out if he's saved. Oh, yeah, he, he's you know, he's been coming to church. I said, well, I see him there, but I, I, I want to go talk to him. So so we set up the meeting. Oh, he's very cordial and so forth. He even complimented my preaching. And I thought that's a plus for him. But um I said, well, John, I have to ask you the question now. Have you ever received Jesus Christ as your Savior? Is he living in your heart? Can you remember a time in your life where you repented of your sin, you believed? He said, I don't believe any of that stuff. I couldn't believe he was saying it to me. I mean, he wanted me to do this ceremony. What, don't you think at least he would fake it, right? He wasn't about to. And... Uh, I'm looking at him like I couldn't believe that he was the, you know, that brash. And he went on and so forth. And really now his whole countenance changed. That's amazing, isn't it? His whole face told me that he wasn't a believer. <laughs> and he went on about it, you know, and he's telling me about all the scientific evidence and proof and so forth. And he doesn't believe all the fairy tales of the Bible and all of this sort of thing. And I'm looking at this woman, I said, and she's I don't know. It was a sad expression that she had on her face, you know. Uh, so I, I said, well, I, I can't marry you. And he was even angrier at that. You know, I can't. I said, I can't do that. And I can't join a safe person or an unsafe person. It's uh, the Bible's very clear about unequal yokes. And uh, and I realized I, I probably now was going to lose a member over it. And uh, I can't. I, that's the way it goes. And um, but later when I got to speak to her, I said, you can't do this. Don't do this. Well, you know, he's got a good heart. And, I, you know, I think I can win him over. I said, don't do this. This is not this will not be good. <laughs> and it wasn't. They did find a preacher that uh, was glad to marry them. And I, I wanted to I don't know what I wanted to do. Actually, I wanted to go down and punch him in the nose. But I know I couldn't do that. But I mean, really. Where is your head? Especially since they told you that they went to another preacher who wouldn't marry them. Well, where is your head? Uh, but go ahead and marry them and have a, you know, you know, blessings and so forth. And mm, just uh, upsetting. But um, she uh, she passed away, I think maybe earlier because of the grief he brought. He brought so much grief to her. And uh, what a warning that should be to to anybody. And, uh, but he lived on for quite a while after that. And it was miserable as could be. Before she died, she said, don't give up on John. I said, I promise I won't. So uh, I went over and would visit him on a regular basis. And uh, everything was congenial until I would bring up the gospel. And then he just, that same face would come on him. And you could just see the hardness. There was no way of getting to him. I got a call that he was dying and went down to McKeesport Hospital to see him. And uh, it, it, it was the day of the Kentucky Derby. Talk about a, a lot of fanfare and nonsense that goes on for three minutes of a race. It's, you know, it, 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 it's amazing to me that people <laughs> get all excited about it. horses running up. I wonder if the horse even understands what he did, right? But at any rate, it was on, and he's watching it. He's dying, but he's got his eye on that Kentucky Derby. And I came down to see him. I said, John, I'm here. He said, I, this is the most important part. I said, oh, okay. So I sat down with him, you know, to watch the exciting. First of all, he had to hear uh, the old Kentucky home. Um, so they sang that, and all these women have these hats that are out like this. Pity the guy that was standing, sitting behind. But at any rate, they're all finally, you know, they're off. 
and there, guy and the, the guy, you know, oh, you know, you know, the horse is doing this, horse is doing that, and they they get a winner at the end of all of it, and so forth. So finally, it's all over. I said, well, John, you know, could we turn the TV off? I, I want to talk. He says, I, I don't want to talk about religion. We're done talking about religion. I said, well, John, you're dying. You're you're about to face God and go to hell. I don't believe any of that. And, can you imagine? He's dying. He knows he's dying. And he died, I think, two or three days after that event. Last opportunity that the Holy Ghost gave him to be saved. And he blew it away. Now, I don't know, and I'll never be able to know, the great mercy of God. Could it be maybe the last dying breath that he might have reached out to Christ? He knew what to do. He had the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, maybe he did. That would be a great surprise. It would be a welcome, happy surprise if I saw him in heaven. And I think he probably thanked me then. Uh, but we'll see. So he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. You know, the law, um, it was unchangeable, immutable, the law of God. Some might call it harsh and uh, is severe. You pick up sticks on a Sabbath day, they stoned you to death for it. You uh, disobeyed your parents, you blasphemed. They, you, it was a capital crime. The law was absolute. It was rigid. And it was a reflection of the nature of Almighty God. It should make all of us fear and understand who God is and standing in His presence. We can see here that Paul is trying to invoke that that's in the heart of every Hebrew, the notion of the law itself and what it represents. Moses' law, you died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment then? Suppose ye shall ye be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified possibility for everybody to be saved, you know, away with limited atonement, Calvinistic nonsense. The, the lost are under the uh, finished work of Jesus and what, <clears throat> what he did and accomplished at that cross was good enough for every living person. No limited atonement here. So the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. In other words, it was the, the law fulfilled in Christ, and it was good enough for even the people that were rejecting it. Now, that won't save them at the end. That would be universalism. But the notion of, of suggesting that what Christ did on the cross was only for the elect people just can't buy into it. We'll never buy into it, as a matter of fact. It all sounds rather intelligent, but uh, when you read the Bible and understand the nature of God, it, uh, that mitigates against the nature of God in the Bible. What we see here um, doing despite under the spirit of grace. Now, I don't have enough time to uh, expatiate this. But it's all about the rejection of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can be insulted. And that's what we have in this, this passage. So you have this uh, down here, you have done despite. So if you go to the Greek word there, it really means to insult the spirit of grace. We don't think too often of this, that we insult our Creator, that God is somehow insulted. Uh, now, I understand it to be an anthropomorphic term that, you know, God isn't insulted like a man is, but He chooses these words intentionally so that we can relate to it. There is something about rejecting the Holy Spirit that is akin to insulting somebody. So one can only imagine offering this, this invitation for sinful people to have all of their sins blotted out and then for a person to reject it and say, I don't want anything. I don't want that. Take it out of here. That sort of thing. So we want to keep all of this in, in mind and in view of what these people in the first century were doing. Now, maybe next week we'll go a little bit further into the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit so we don't confuse and... Uh, we certainly want to understand what Jesus was teaching about, again, in Matthew chapter 12, where he speaks of this, uh, a sin that cannot be forgiven. 
and what this line may be, and it's, there's too much detail to give it in the last minute or two. So, so let us pray, Lord. Now we thank you that the Holy Spirit was real in our lives. <clears throat> we sensed that time that he came and he drew us with cords of love and mercy. He uh, spoke to the heart, he convicted us, he even brought a certain degree of fear. We were intimidated by the thought of standing before a holy God and trying to defend ourselves. Uh, we were made aware of what sin was and we seemed to understand it and uh, were inbred with a guilty conscience. So we thank you for all that, Lord, that ultimately led us to that point of true conversion where we gave up our own selves to you. Now, Lord, there are those uh, that we see here in this book, and perhaps, Lord, we can even think of those that we have uh, in a contemporary circumstance, people that we work with or people that we've spoken to or people that have come to church even that it seems as though that, that work of regeneration is lacking. And so, God, we just pray, pray, Lord, that we'll continue faithful in giving out the word, living that word so that we are a viable witness, and that, Lord, you would continue with your Holy Spirit to knock on the door and that people would have that opportunity till the very last breath. How can we know, Lord? We know that your mercy is greater than anything we've ever understood or partaken in as humans. And so, Lord, it might well be that we might find a lot of surprises in heaven, and so we hope, so we can hope. In the meantime, let us do our very best to get the gospel in those hearts and to establish people in that truth. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite you to accept the plan of salvation that God has laid forth from the foundations of the earth. And the first point of that plan is that all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So begin by confessing your sin before God that you have sinned against him. and You can't even recollect all of the times that you've offended him. He has the record, and that record needs to be expunged. Secondly, it's important to know that God will punish sin. If it goes without atonement, we will pay the ultimate price. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal price is hell, fire, and brimstone. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. But Jesus paid the price and made the atonement on the cross. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He made an end to our damnation and our debt that we owed to him, paid by his own blood and justifies us before a holy God. On the third day, in triumph, Jesus rises from the dead. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So call upon him today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation.
Come in to stay. Come in to.